architectures in general. So, in the beginning, like around 1960, uh, if you look at computers and computer systems, uh, the applications were usually mainframe applications. There was this big mainframe. Uh, some of these mainframes actually were larger than a room. And um, these mainframes were often located in the, in the basement of big companies, big insurance companies, uh, uh, large banks. And the, uh, the mainframe was you know, sitting in the basement and throughout the building there were these text terminals. So if you, if you think of it uh, as a client server architecture, you can say, well, the, the client is nothing but a text terminal. The server is the mainframe. And the big advantage of this mainframe architecture is it's very easy to manage your applications. If you want to install a new application, what you do is you install a new application on the mainframe, and then it will work on every client. Because the client doesn't need to, doesn't, doesn't need to run any, any programs or any application. The application actually runs on the mainframe. So that, that's the big advantage of the mainframe architecture. It's very easy to manage your application because it's centralized. It's only the mainframe that you have to, you have to consider. The downside, however, of, of the mainframe architecture is that if the mainframe is not working, you can't do anything with your client. You've got a blinking cursor and that's it. You won't do anything for you. So the client is completely powerless without the server. That doesn't matter. <laughs> um, <laughs> it shouldn't happen, but if it does happen, then you have these powerless clients. So that, that, that was the vulnerability, of course. I mean, if the mainframe goes down, then everybody can go out and have a cup of coffee because nobody can work. And that's also one of the reasons, like, if you look at the next stage in application development, what you see is all the computing power that used to be located in the mainframe is sort of distributed out. And I call that the PC here. Right? It's, it's the personal computer. Everybody's got their own computing device. It's, it's computing power for the masses. And the big advantage, of course, is that you're no longer dependent on the, the mainframe. You're no longer dependent on the applications installed on the mainframe. So as an end user, as a 
as the owner of the PC, you had all this freedom about, well, what are the applications that I want to run? I can just install it on my own personal computer and I can use it. The downside, however, from, from a corporate perspective, in the old days you had one mainframe and a thousand terminals. Now you suddenly have 1,000 PCs to manage. So if you want to upgrade your program or upgrade an application, you have to go to all these thousand PCs, all these thousand PCs and, and upgrade your application. So it's like a it's a management nightmare. Um, so, advantages, more applications for the end user, disadvantages, you have to manage all these applications that are, the, that are installed on all these different PCs. Now, if you look at, uh, you know, the time span, we're around like 1980. You know, the, the first IBM PC you see over there? It's all, uh, most of the applications are text-based. So it's still the same as in the mainframe days where you have text terminals. Uh, the PC, the early PCs that were running text applications, mainly text applications. So the next evolution that, that you can see in uh, application architecture is, uh, you know, the interface. The interface that the end user uses to interact with the application gets richer. So the term uh, WIMP uh, is introduced <coughs> somewhere around you know, 1985, it's more around 1990. That's when graphical user interfaces really become popular. Um, so from there, from there on, you can talk about having a rich desktop application with all these you know, rich controls. You've got input fields, buttons, and, uh, windows icons, menus, pointers. And um, if you look at advantages and disadvantages of, of, of the, the graphical user interface, I want to start with the disadvantage first. Uh, the disadvantage is increased complexity, and, and increased complexity for two groups of people. First of all, there's increased complexity for the end user. Because, well, in the old days, you only had to get this simple text uh, interface. Now all of a sudden you have this rich graphical user interface with all kinds of different controls. Now it might be more powerful to use, but it's also more difficult to understand. So for a novice user, um, it's more difficult to understand this rich graphical user interface. Um, there's also a downside from, from application, from, from the perspective of an application developer. In the old days, writing user interfaces used to be quite easy. The only thing you could get from the other side was, well, get me the text that was input, uh, inputted at the keyboard. And that's about the only interaction you could have. With rich uh, user interfaces, all of a sudden, the user could decide for himself what he wants to do. Do I want to press this button first, or do I want to select the radio button? Uh, and the application was expected to support all these you know, different interactions. So it was more difficult to build the, you know, to realize these user interfaces. Now, um, in Holland we have a saying that every, every disadvantage has, a, has an advantage. Um, and this, this disadvantage also has an advantage because to manage this increased complexity, what happened is a lot of developers adapted uh, the, the model view controller paradigm, framework, pattern, I don't, know, really, don't really know how you want to call it, but it's the MVC model. So, is, is there anybody who's never heard of MVC? So everybody knows MVC. I, I don't have to explain that then. So that's a, you know, a different way of, of looking at controlling the complexity of user interfaces. By separating them into different components. You have a model that, has, that contains or describes the value that should be displayed. A view that describes how it should be displayed, and a controller that decides how uh, how the, the the user interface component should react or should respond to user interaction. Um, now, one of the consequences of, of having a rich user interface um, is that you really need uh, a GUI guy on the team or a GUI girl. It doesn't have to be a guy. 
um, because it's my, uh, well, in my experience, and, and probably the, also the experience of a lot of developers out there, if you're a good software developer, that doesn't mean that you're very good at designing graphical user interfaces, or vice versa. I mean, people that are very good at designing graphical user interfaces are not always very good at writing software. So, the consequence was that if you want to build successful, uh, rich uh, user interfaces, then you need somebody on the team that knows what it means to have a rich user interface. It doesn't mean that put every element on there that, 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 that you can, because that's usually what developers do, just put elements on the user interface. So that was one of the consequences. Um, now the next step, yeah, or the next stage in the history, is sort of going back to the old days again. This is what, what I call the web applications mature, the web 2.0, if you like. It's uh, described as, you know, the rich internet applications, where it used to be, you know, rich desktop applications, and now all of a sudden we have, you know, the same rich user interface. The only difference is, is that the ap application is no longer running on your machine. The application is actually running on the server. So the client-server architecture that we also saw in the mainframe era is back again. And so we have the same advantage as we had in, in the mainframe era because it's very easy to upgrade your application. Just upgrade the application as it is installed on the server and, you know, clients will... You don't, you don't need to upgrade the clients anymore. However, one of the downside, or one of, one of the disadvantages of rich internet application is which technology are you going to use to realize this you know, rich internet application? Are you going to choose uh, Microsoft Silverlight for the client or are you going to choose Adobe? Uh, the, the flex solution to build uh, the rich user interface on the client <laughs> side. Uh, there's Java, which has initiatives to, you know, to improve the client side. There's Google with Google Web Toolkit. If you look at the server side, do you want to use C side or not? So it's dynamic times. I mean, if, if you make a choice right now and you say, well, we'll pick Adobe in five years' time, nobody. Or everybody will laugh, will laugh at you and say, well, why did you pick Adobe? Well, so it's difficult. It's difficult to make the right choice right now. There's a lot of technologies, a lot of initiatives, but we're not, we're not really sure where we're going or who will win. All right. So that's where we are right now. We have rich web applications, rich internet applications, application running on the server side, flying is nothing more but, you know, displaying the HTML. Well, that was just a brief introduction to get into the architecture that we're using for Web Terminal. Web Terminal is, is a client server architecture. Web Terminal is a web application. Um, so if you look at the architecture of Web Terminal, um, press the right button. What we have is we've got a client side, and we know that the client side will be, you know, a browser, and we know that the server side will. That's where the web application, the web application will run. And we also know that the protocol that the two sides use to communicate with each other will be HTTP or HTTPS. Those things are given. We cannot change that. We're stuck with it. Now, on top of these requirements, we've added some more requirements for both the client and the server side. First, the client side. If you look at the browser, um, we don't want to support every browser out there for web server. So we, uh, we selected to, to support modern browsers. And with modern browsers, we mean if you look at Internet Explorer 6, or if you look at the Internet Explorer family, we're going to support it from, from uh, version 6 and up, with 6 and 7, and well, 8 is out as well. If you look at the Firefox family, we're not going back to Firefox 1 anymore. We're only testing for Firefox 2 and 3. We're also testing for Safari and Opera, but we're only testing the most recent version of, of those browsers. So we have some requirements about the browser. It has to be, uh, you know, quite recent. You can't use Netscape 4 anymore. Uh, another restriction on the, on the client side is uh, if you look at our customers, 
our customers are uh, usually working on these, you know, corporate networks, and they have no control about what plugins are installed in their browser. I mean, it's the IT department. The IT department decided that this is the browser that I have to use at work. Now, the consequence for us as, as, a, as a developer, or as, as the, the developers of the web applications, is we cannot use solutions that depend on, you know, additional plugins inside the browser. Because our customers won't be able to install those plugins, therefore they won't be able to run our applications, therefore they'll go to our competitors, and we don't want that. But we cannot have Flash or, you know, Smalltalk plugins uh, installed on the browser side. The only thing we have is JavaScript. That's the only language we can really use on the browser or on the client side. <laughs> Another consequence of these, uh, of these corporate networks that, that the customers are using is that most of these networks are running behind a firewall. And there are many firewall uh, implementations out there, and some of them are good and some of them are bad. And some of the bad ones won't allow you to have a long-lived connection between a browser and, a, and the server without exchanging information over this connection. So if the firewall detects a connection that has been there for a couple of seconds, but nothing's being transported over that connection, it will just kill that connection. That means that... Uh, is everybody familiar with Comet and Server Push, the model that they use for that? Where they use a long-lived connection where the browser sends out a single request to the web application and the web application can actually send multiple responses back to the client. And all these multiple responses will go over the same connection. Uh, so that's, that's the model they use for Comet. And with that model you can actually implement the Server Push model where the web application can just push its data back to the client. That's something we cannot do, because it won't work uh, for our customer. So the only thing we can do from the, the, from the browser side is send out a single request and get a single response back, and that's it. So it's no fancy stuff to, uh, to implement server push. Um, those were the requirements for the client side. And if we look at the server side, where the web application runs, uh, we've made some you know, common assumptions. First of all, the assumption is that we're only going to contact the web application if it involves dynamic content. If it involves static content, the web application won't be contacted. They'll, they'll, um, the static content will be served, for example, uh, by Apache. So there's an Apache web server in front of the web application. It will serve a it will serve all the static resources, and only if, a re if there is a request for dynamic content, that request will be sent to the web application. Another requirement that we uh, use for the web application is that the web application has to use MVC. <coughs> so the web application has to, has to have a clear separation between domain objects, which are completely independent of any presentation technology and there are presentation objects. So if you think of it in terms of MVs and Cs, uh, the models are the domain objects, the Vs and the Cs, the views and the controllers are the presentation objects. And there's a clear separation between the two. Why do we want this? Well, it's because we all, we've already built the domain logic. It's working. It's running at the customer. They're, you know, they're satisfied with it. We don't want to change it. We don't want to rebuild everything. So we want to reuse the domain, let, the domain logic that we already have. The thing that we want to change is how does the application present itself to the end user? So what we want to do is we want to rebuild the views and the controllers, but we want to reuse the models. So that's, that's the context for, for WebTerm. And if you look at Web Terminal itself, what we do is we say, well, you can think of the browser as if it is, you know, it's a terminal. It's the same text terminal that we had in, in the mainframe era. The only thing it should do is display a user interface and tell the server what the user actually did to the user interface. So the responsibilities of the terminal, you know, the client side, is it should render a rich user interface. 
and with which user interface, I mean, uh, it should have the, you know, the user interface components that you expect and that you see in, in all kinds of applications, like input fields, images, buttons, the stuff that you use to build user interface, rich user interface. So the terminal, the client side, should be capable of displaying these user interface components. Now besides just displaying these user interface components, the terminal is also responsible to record how the user is going to interact with these components. So if the user enters some text in an input field and selects a particular radio button, and checks in a checkbox, all these user interactions are recorded at the client side. The terminal records what the user has done to the user interface. And then at particular moments in time, it's going to report these changes back to the web application. Now, it's going to use an XML HTTP request to, to do the reporting. So it's going to use an AJAX request to tell the server, well, these are the changes that have happened on the client side. And when it gets a response back from the server, the response will describe how the user interface should be updated on the client side. So the terminal is responsible to, you know, to render these updates of the rich user interface. And then we're back to step one again. Once the rich user interface is displayed to the end user, you can interact with it, you can change stuff. Those changes should be reported, reported back to the server, and then we have a simple loop. So that's the terminal side. It's quite simple. It's, it, that's what a terminal does. It displays a user interface. It doesn't have any application logic or whatsoever. All the application logic is located at the server side. So if you look at the server side, what should the web application be? What, what should the web application do? Well, <coughs> it should maintain, it should actually compute the user interface that is going to be displayed on the client side. So the server has to maintain the MVC object. It has to maintain the views and controller objects who have counterparts on the client side. Now when a request from the terminal comes in, what the web application should do is, is replay the user interactions that have already taken place on the client side. Now, how, how does that, what does it mean to replay the user interaction? Well, it's very easy. You should talk to the controller objects. So you talk to the controller objects located on the server side. And then the whole MVC paradigm framework pattern kicks in again. Because when you talk to the controller objects, what will happen is they will probably cause changes to your underlying domain objects as well. And these changes... Um, will be picked up by the view objects on the server side and the view objects will, will be updated so the user interface will change so the responsibility for the web application is to detect which views have changed and how they change so it records view updates on the server side and these updates to the views are then reported back again to the client which will actually render these updates and display the rich user interface to the user again. <laughs> so this is, uh, I think this is the central slide. This, this actually describes what Web Terminal does. Although it's HTTP between the terminal and the web application, HTTP is the transportation protocol. We use HTTP to, you know, to actually send the message to the other side. If you look at it, you know, one abstraction layer above that, we've got our own protocol that the terminal and web application are using to synchronize. And we call this the Delta protocol. So it's del Delta for changes. They communicate changes. User interface changes are communicated between terminal and web application. So if you... If you think of the Delta protocol, of, well, what are its capabilities? Um, well, it should be able to synchronize two user interfaces. It should be able to synchronize a rich user interface that is actually displayed on the client side with what I would like to call a virtual user interface on the server side. 
It's a virtual user interface because it's never really displayed on the screen, but it is computed. Computed, you know, the, the server actually computes all the view and control objects, but they're virtual. They're not really displayed on any screen. Um, another important requirement is that we should only communicate significant changes. So, um, for example, we're going to completely ignore mouse and keyboard events at the terminal side. We're not going to talk to the, the terminal is not going to talk to the web application to tell uh, the application that the, the mouse has moved two pixels. Because if we do that, then we need a lot of messages to synchronize uh, terminal and, and, and server side. Um, so it's, it's at, a, at, at a higher abstraction layer. Also, what we do not do, is if, you, if you've, uh, everything I've said so far also applies to the X-Window protocol, or X-Window system. X-Window system is exactly the same. Application is running somewhere on a remote machine, and the only thing I'm seeing on my own machine is the user interface on that application. However, if you look at the X-Window system, it will actually guarantee that the user interface is Pixel for pixel the same if you run it on machine A or on machine B. So it's, it's quite a low level protocol in the sense of how you synchronize user interfaces. It, it actually goes down to the level of bitmaps, where they synchronize bitmaps between uh, you know, the, the screen, the client, and the application that's running on the server. We're not doing that. We're, we're, taking, we're taking the abstraction layer higher. So we... Uh, the only thing we do is we synchronize what we call high-level UI components, or you know, the common name is, of course, the widgets. We synchronize widgets on the client side with the widgets on the server side. Now, the kinds of widgets that we use, uh, well, they can be found in, in, in many widget libraries. We've got these uh, non-interactive widgets to display stuff, display text in a label, display some image or use a ruler to you know, divide uh, particular sections in your user interface. We've got the common buttons, the push buttons, or link buttons, which are rendered as hyperlinks, uh, image buttons, you know, the regular stuff. I might, I'll give a short demonstration of the widgets that we have. Um, oh, this, is, this is a good example. This is, a, this is an example of a tree widget. This is not a good example. Okay, go on. Let's try. Is the session expired then? That helps. Alright. So we've got a tree widget. We've got images that you can specify. We've got the labels. We say. So the widget is, is the one actually displayed in the, in the red uh, square. So we've got this, this collection, uh, let's see, checkboxes. Um, this is perhaps a nice example. Um, like I said, the, the client records changes on the you know, the change is made on the, the, the client side, and only at particular moments in time does it actually contact the server. And this is what we call uh, the propagation delay. Now, every widget can say what kind of propagation delay should be used to, you know, the delay it should use before it actually is going to contact the server. If the propagation delay is not specified at all, and what you do is you, you can just change the widgets. So this is um, the widget as it is displayed on the client side. I can use this widget to control it from the server side. Oh, sorry. So, um, this, this 
this is how the checkbox is displayed on the blind side. And these are you know, properties we can use to control uh, that widget from the server side. So for example, if I press it up here, you see that um, what we do is a message has been sent. So this, this is the actual request and response. Um, so what we've... Uh, I'm not sure whether I should do this. It's probably too much detail. What the client will actually say to the application is that some property has changed. The name of that property is called value. The new value is that has become false. And the kind of change is what we call a property value delta. And we have to indicate what the widget was. So that's what the client tells the application. And then the application will tell in the response That, so basically what happened is, this checkbox went from true to false, was reported to the server, and the server is going to tell in the response that the checkbox displayed in the red uh, square should go to false as well. So that's the response that we're seeing here. We get a property value back again from the server, but this time with a different ID, because it's that checkbox on the client that should correspond with the checkbox on the server. This is just to get an idea of the widgets that we have. Um, <coughs> all right. Other important widgets are the group widgets, where you put several widgets together and you display them in a, in a, in a panel, which can be horizontal or vertically. You can also use grid layouts, we're going to see that in the demo. Um, well, I won't, won't discuss them all. The bottom line is um, that the set of widgets that we use should be sufficient to build administrative applications. Because that's what we're, we're giving to our customers, it's an administrative application. Web Terminal is not meant to, to build applications or, or interactive games on the client side. We have five more minutes. Yeah. Okay. Why do we have 20 more minutes? I don't know. I thought I had an hour. It says 545 on the schedule. Yeah. So you got 20 minutes on it. So let's continue with the client side then. Uh, I still have half an hour now. Can anybody tell me how much time I still have? Ask the next, the next guy. The next guy. The next guy. All right, so nobody's giving the answer, I just continue. At least 20. At least 20, all right. Well, that should be aim, aim for 5.30, you'll be safe enough. All right, I shall just, I'll try and speed up. Are there any questions so far? Is the architecture of Web Terminal, is everybody clear with the idea? Basically, it's back to the mainframe. <coughs> application is running at the server side. <coughs> application is actually computing a user interface on the server side. The only thing the client has to do is display this user interface and report what interactions <coughs> the user has taken on the client side. Now, if you look at the technologies, what kind of technologies do we use on the, do we use on the client side? Like I said earlier, we cannot install plugins for the browsers. So JavaScript is basically the only option that we have. We have to use JavaScript to program the terminal behavior on the client side. Um, now we, we, we're not going to build everything from scratch. Um, at the core of Web Terminal, we are using uh, the prototype library, which is a you know a JavaScript library, and uh, the latest version of Prototype uh, offers uh, some very powerful mechanisms. Mechanisms that are missing in JavaScript. In 
in the newest version, you can actually define classes and inheritance and, and delegate to a super method. So you can, you can have a real class structure in JavaScript. Now on top of this class structure, we've added our own mixing implementation. If you look at all the widgets that we have, and if you, you organize them in an inheritance graph, then these widgets will have many things in common, even though they don't share a common parent in the inheritance graph. For example, if you look at labels, now we have a label widget which is capable of displaying a label. But we have tons of other widgets which are also capable of displaying a label. So what we do is we describe the behavior of what it means to have a label, we describe that once in a mixing, and then we can distribute that mixing at several locations in the inheritance graph. So that, you know, keeps things simple. Simple and concise. Um, now we also use jQuery, but jQuery is not part of the core of Web Terminal. So in the future we might drop jQuery, I'm not sure. Right now we're using jQuery to implement particular widgets. Uh, for example, jQuery's got a very good date picker. I can show that. There is the date input. You know, it's got this uh, nice little calendar that shows you can select the date and it will fill it in inside the input field. So it's powerful and it's working. So we want to use it. So what we do is we integrate the jQuery library with a web terminal. Why is it showing? Oh, there it is. So we're using jQuery to implement some of the widgets, but not many, not that many. Uh, now the, the, the final part that we're using on the client side is called Xena, which stands for Xena is not HTML area. HTML area is an old uh, text editor written completely in JavaScript. It's not based on jQuery or prototype. And it allows you to do rich text editing. So it looks like Word. Word is running in the browser. Now we've also encountered some issues uh, whilst you know, building the first version of Web Terminal. Um, now the most important issue that we encountered was performance. Now, performance is a real problem, uh, well, especially for the Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer 6, or Internet Explorer 7 as well, but both of them, the performance of both browsers is not very uh, good. And we traced the, the problem back to uh, the way how we render the widgets on the client side. Because what we do is, we use a lot of DOM calls. The DOM is uh, an API you can use to you know, add elements to the browser, so add a paragraph or add a heading. And it's all done from JavaScript. You've got calls to you know, insert a new row in a table. And it turns out that these DOM calls, the implementation of the DOM API in the Internet Explorer well, really sucks, I should say. Um, we had to, just to give you an example, we had, a, we had a page that took 30 seconds to render in Internet Explorer 6 and it took the Safari browser on Windows less than 2 seconds to render exactly the same page with exactly the same data. So this, the performance is like at least 15 times slower than Safari. Now although there are browsers uh, on which the first version was already working, Again, we have the customers to deal with. Fact is, a lot of our customers are using Internet Explorer. So we knew we had problems. We had to improve the rendering mechanism because it had to work on the Internet Explorer as well. So we rewrote the whole rendering mechanism and basically said, don't do anything with the DOM anymore. So we build, what we do is we build an HTML representation, the HTML source. And only in the final moment do we actually put that source in, in the DOM tree. And, well, that way we improve performance quite a bit. Uh, another issue that we encountered is the support for CSS, cascading style sheets. Uh, CSS is very, a very powerful standard, but 
a lot of things from the standard are not implemented in the browser, in, in uh, Intel Explorer 6. It's getting better in Intel Explorer 7, but still, <coughs> our customers, many of our customers are still on Intel Explorer 6. So there were a lot of CSS things that we couldn't use because it wasn't implemented in Intel Explorer 6. Also, the way the browser uh, treats events or, or handles events. Uh, good example is the key press or key down. If you press backspace, then some browsers will actually report this as a key press event, while other browsers only report this as a key down event. Now, if you want to build something that works on all browsers, that's annoying. Uh, and sometimes it's very difficult to debug. So sometimes it's not running on the client side and you want to find out where, what the hell is going on. Where, where is it going wrong? Uh, some browsers have, have quite good debugging support. Other, browse, other browsers are very poor or have no support at all for debugging. So it's like guessing. Guessing what might be wrong, throwing in a lot of alerts to see what the program is doing. But there's no professional debugger available. All right, the server side. For the server side, we basically what we said is, we like the way you build desktop applications in Smalltalk. We think that's the good, that, that's the way to build applications. Now, how do you build applications? How do you build the desktop applications in Smalltalk? What you do is you start with an application model, and usually it's the application model that also specifies the so-called window spec. And when you open an application, what happens is uh, the UI builder is created, it takes information from the Windows back, it will use this information to build actual widgets, and the builder will also ensure that these widgets are connected to the model object. object. And it's the responsibility of the application model basically to link the widgets to the appropriate domain object. So that if the domain changes, the presentation objects will be notified and they can change as well. Now this model is, is good. We like it. It's working. So we want to build applications for web terminal in exactly the same way. Um, we just change terminology a little bit. First of all, we're not talking about application models, we're, we're calling it applications, because that's what they are. They are applications. <coughs> we're not calling it a window spec, because we're not specifying a user window anymore, we're calling it a page spec. Uh, because we're specifying how the web page should look like, how the rich user interface should look like within the browser. Then, the same story, uh, from there on the, the story, the story is exactly the same. There is a web widget builder which takes the information from the page spec to actually build the web widgets, which are the view and controller objects on the server side. And these controllers, or these widgets, will be connected to the domain objects um, because the application has provided all these connections. So again, it's the responsibility of the application to connect presentation objects to domain objects. So if you, think of, uh, if you think of it in terms of a software stack, what we have, we've got this existing domain layer. This is where all the domain logic is located to do competent management for file It's working, we like it. On top of that, we build a presentation layer. That's where the view and controller objects live. That's where the web widgets live. Now the application is basically this thin layer between presentation and domain. The application will make sure that the objects that live in the presentation layer are connected to objects living in the domain layer. Now Web Terminal, what Web Terminal adds to the whole mix is that on top of the presentation layer, what we have is what we call a synchronization layer. And it's the responsibility of the synchronization layer to use the Delta protocol to synchronize the with the user interface as it is displayed on the client side. So if you look at the client side, it also has a synchronization layer that, um, well, that, that, that is able to synchronize widgets living in this layer with widgets living in this layer. So that's, you know, basically the idea. That's, that's what a terminal is. Then, I still have like 20 minutes to do it yet. Um, in, in, 
my experience, the, the, the demos are always the most convincing. It's the most convincing way. I mean, I can give you a lot of theory, but demonstrating really convinces people. And what we're going to do in this demo is, uh, well, we're going to build an application that everybody's seen before, and every tutorial uses it. We're going to build a chat application. And this is what the user interface should look like. So if you think of it in terms of elements, what are the elements located in this user interface? Well, there are labels. Um, there are text input fields. People should be able to input what the name is. There is this large text area where they can enter the text that they want to share with the other people in the chat room. There is a submit button to actually send that text over to the server side. And there are several labels to uh, display what you've been saying in the chat room and also what others have been saying in the chat room. So these are the widgets at the bottom layer. Now we have to group these widgets. Now to group the widgets on top, these four widgets, what we do is we put them in a grid. So we use a grid layout to ensure that the widgets are rendered uh, this way. So a grid is able to define rows and columns and put widgets in the cells that, that are created now. And these messages, we simply put them in a panel. It's a vertical panel, so if you add another label, uh, it will add another row to this. Now the final widget that we need is, we need to group the grid layout and the, the panel that contains all the messages. So this, this, this will be our top level widget that we specify. <coughs> So this is the way that you should build your application. First, or not, not the way you should do it, but the way you can build applications. Start with some user interface design. And then try and translate this into a spec. And this is what a spec looks like. This is the spec that we use for the, the chat application. So I, I try to use uh, indenting to show uh, the different levels. So this is the panel at the highest level. It's a vertical panel. And what we add is we add, first of all, we add a grid. So that that's will be the one displayed on top. We have to define columns, because the grid, the grid consists of rows and columns. Now we have to define how wide the columns are and how high the rows are. If we don't really care, we can use the term automatic or auto. Um, then if you look at the grid, you've created a grid with four cells. We put widgets in the different cell. We put a label in the first cell located at 1.1. So x coordinate first, y coordinate second. The second cell will contain the text input, uh, which uh, where the name can be entered. So this is where we define an aspect, and this aspect has to be implemented by the application. So whenever a user inputs his name, it will end up as an aspect of our application, the, the, the setter aspect of name will be used to give the application the name. And the submit button, um, it, there are several things you can specify for this button. First of all, it has a label. Again, it's a labelable. But this is where we use the, the, the labelable mixing again. Uh, there is an aspect. Now, this time the aspect is, is used to describe the action. So whenever the push button is pressed, in the end, what will happen is the submit method, or the submit method, sorry, submit message will be sent to the application. So the application can decide what, what has to, what should happen when somebody submits a new text. Uh, the acceleration is, uh, you can actually connect buttons to keys on the keyboard. So whenever I press enter on the keyboard, it will have the same effect as pressing the push button. And there is more to it. If you look at the final cell of the grid, what it, it contains the text area, so you can have <coughs> multiple lines of text. Again, we have to tell which aspect it should use to store that text in the application. You can say something about how many rows it should display. So then we have, we're through with the grid. And then the only thing that we have to add is the panel containing all the messages. Now, to specify this, we're not going to use a panel spec, we're going to use what we call a repeater spec. 
and the repeater spec works as follows. Um, the repeater spec, in the end, it will result in a panel. So like a panel, yeah, you can, uh, you can say whether it's vertical or horizontal. Um, and the collection aspect of this repeater spec, what happens is the repeater spec will iterate over the elements in the collection. And for every element, it will execute the spec uh, part. So uh, the, the assumption here is that the application will have an aspect called messages. This will be a list of strings, an ordered collection of strings. And the repeater spec will iterate over these strings and actually create labels for these strings. So that you will end up with having a vertical panel containing all the, all the strings. So this is um, a description of how the user interface, what the user interface should look like. And what we're going to do is we're going to build this application. Um, so let's start building it. We're going to build a new application. We're going to subclass from an application. We're going to call it the chat application. And then we can add our spec to it. So we call we have a category, we use the spec category, and I simply take this information, copy it. So it's, it will be part of the page spec method. So this is the first part, then the second part. You have a page back, that's, that's the first method. That's the one that describes the user interface. Now in this, in this description, we've used several what we call aspects. So we have, we need the application to deliver these aspects. Now these aspects, um, for these aspects, they will always be consulted on the instance side first. So, um, well, let's take a look at the page back in more detail. First, uh, let's take a look at the name that people can use. So what we say is that the application should have a name aspect. So we need some instance variable in the application to hold the name. What we also need is a text aspect to hold the text that has been entered. By. Now, I'm going to use a trick here. We need a name and we need a text. But I know that we're going to use these things um, and we're going to connect them to presentation objects. They'll be connected to the widgets. Now these widgets will use, or they will register themselves um, as being interested in changes to the name or changes to the text. Now we've, uh, Bout has created something that we call Holderize. What we're going to do is, we're going to create holders for the name and for the text. So, where in the original class definition I said name and text, it has now created a name holder and a text holder for us. And it has also created accessors, so it has getters for the name, it has a setter for the name, and it also has getters and setters for the holder. And it, it has done this for both the name and for the text. Now this is um, this is the stuff that one single user can enter uh, on the client side. So for every user we should have, uh, or for every user that is using the chat application, we should have a name and a text on the instance side of the application. Now the story is different for the messages. What we said is the repeater spec. We said that the repeater spec used, used the aspect uh, messages. However, if we have two people using the chat application, we want them to see the same collection of messages. I mean, that's what it means to <coughs> chat. We want to exchange information. So the way that we can resolve this is say, saying that we need messages on the instance side. 
We need them on the instance side, but it will actually be delivered by the class side. So we're going to delegate to the class side and say, well, the class side is responsible to actually deliver the messages. For that, we need a class instance variable on the class side, all that messages as well. And we create an accessor for messages. Messages. Now, initially, it will be nil. I could, of course, write an initialize method. I'm going to uh, take the easy route. If messages is nil, what we're going to do is we're going to initialize it. We're going to initialize an empty list. Basically, the observed list means that it's a holder as well. It will announce changes to the list as well. We have five minutes left. Now, five minutes left. Should be enough. Should be enough. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Message. All right. Um, the initialize, this, this has been generated by the holder wise, so initially the name will be nil, the text will be nil. Now the only thing that I still have to specify, if I want to try this in a browser right now, this is the URL I should use. I should specify that we want to start an implication of the chat application. It won't work. Because we haven't told uh, the system that the chat application is in fact a top level application. It is an entry point. So for that we've got uh, a method as well. Is entry is entry point. But you should read now. I know. <laughs> we have our chat application. So I can enter a name here, say some text, submit it. Then we have an exception. That's exactly. So we know now what the uh, what has happened is it has what it, it tried to call the submit. Submit wasn't there. What does what should submit do? Well, it should add uh, the name that says the text, right? Try it again. There it is. If I say something else, submit. Now the problem is, of course, if I do this in another browser, how much minutes? How many minutes do I have? Zero. Zero. <laughs> <laughs> to continuously contact the server to see if there are new messages. Now, it's very easy, because the only thing is you have to tell that it should renew, basically renew leads. It should check for every two seconds, or no, let's make it into one second. Every one second it should check. So if I enter a different text here, It has. Oh shit! Yeah, yeah, you're right. I have to refresh. So enter something here. Submit. It appears over here, and it won't appear over here because I have refreshed. What might be wrong? I have refreshed. All right. Unfortunately, all the demos today didn't work. Well, this this demo didn't work either. Still not able to check. Thank you very much for your... Uh...